move to the question and answer for right now. So there are two mics set up, and we'll probably just have one person come in one here just for fairness. And if you could probably speak up a bit when you come. Are the mics on? I think it's on. Okay. So thank you for setting this up. It's a lot of fun. Are you? Took the bus here. Uh, Canadian public transport. Um, yeah, so I am a egalitarian feminist, to borrow your uh, term, I think it's a very good term, but growing up, uh, being born female, growing up female, um, there were certainly, being in the sex class, certain things that I had to go through that um, males don't go through, this is a given and it's okay. Um, I was thinking about the, the trans issue for quite a long time now. Um, having male-bodied people in, uh, in female-only spaces um, is a bit of a concern for me at this point. I don't have children, and I'm 49 years old, so, you know, I've seen it all. But uh, I think that it is a very important issue, especially for younger people um, in places that are clothing optional, things like that. It's, uh, I think, very important. Uh, I can say I'm, I'm also a biological essentialist. I've been, that's been thrown at me as a slur, actually, not long ago, which was shocking to me. And I think that males and females are different. Um, I believe in equality. But I want to know what you guys think males' responsibilities are in this realm, because it really doesn't affect males in, in terms of their day-to-day. -day. You won't go into a... Uh, you won't go into a you know, into a locker room and have, you know, a naked man in front of you. you know. Anyway, so I want to ask you what you think the responsibility is for, for males in this situation. And also, just to tell you my, my small bit of what I do to make things better, I, will refu I refuse to use the word cis, because the way I express my gender makes no difference. I'm a heterosexual female. I don't think anybody needs any, anything more than that. If I, if I show, if I, you know, present as female or male, who cares? So I think cis is a ridiculous word. And also I won't use trans woman. I'll use male to trans. Because there are women and there are men. And that's it. And I want to know what you guys think. So that's my little bit of what I do. So I don't know if we can start this way, Dr. Peterson, Dr. Amate, and then Dr. Sad to take the, the questions directly to the three of them? Yes, sure. Okay. I don't actually know how to answer that. <laughs> I mean, you asked about male responsibility. I can speak to that a bit more generally. I think that, you know, it's men's responsibility to grow up and to, to strengthen themselves to the point where the fact that life is tragic and, and rife with malevolence doesn't crush them. That's hard. I think if men do that, which is what they should be encouraged to do in the truest sense of the word, then they'll be the sorts of people that women can rely on when women need to rely on them. That's usually when they have children. And that's the best course of action for us. It's the proper course of action. It's the life-affirming course of action. It's, it's the heroic course of action. And the alternative is an exaggeration of suffering and or people who've had these types of experiences whether it's a parent whose child as I mentioned earlier uh, number one and number two when I go on media like I was on a CBC radio interview a couple of days ago and they were trying to really push not they but the callers were trying to push a certain agenda that you know and, and it was you know the PC corrected you know the PC agenda and I just stood up I said no you're wrong you can't just say that. Like someone is saying, no, men are not confused with their roles in society these days. Uh, we we're talking more about a sexual role, but interacting with women. It's a bit different from your point. But the point is, I stood up and said, no, I've spoken to many men. Men are confused. They don't know what's right and what's wrong. What makes them a good man? Uh, Dr. Peterson has a pretty good idea of what would be a good, strong, solid man, or woman, or whoever. But today, it's getting confused, and I think that we really need to stand up and not just follow some ideology. Like, yes, if I say hello in the wrong tone, tone I've just verbally raped somebody. We can't have this insanity. So it's a little bit different from your question, but the idea is just bringing nuance into the discussion, not allowing ourselves to be blinded by the ideology of the day, 
and really asking questions, speaking to people, and talking to the people who are affected by these kinds of decisions. That's what I'm trying to do. So, yeah, bring a voice to everybody. As a, no disrespect, but as a courtesy to all the other people that are waiting, yeah. I'll refrain from answering the same questions just so that we can get more people. Sure. Thank you. All right. All right, this question is directed to citizen Jordan Peterson. And I, <laughs> and I, I ask this question because I'm probably literally your biggest fan, measured both by uh, lean muscle mass and enthusiasm for material. And he has a clip for it, be careful. Yeah, yeah. this has all been planned out, don't worry. I'm not an amateur. Um, <laughs> would you rather be known as the Dan Bilzerian of clinical psychology or as the Ernest Shackleton of cultural shit disturbers? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there was a phrase that Dr. Emate used earlier. Um, it was something like Kate Daddy? Yeah, I think that was it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll go with that. Yeah. on campus as you start to butt heads with um, other, other perspectives. Uh, the Basuma Khan at Dow incident recently is where you really see this to manifest, so I would encourage you to look it up and make people in your lives aware of it because it'll make people conscious of the importance of the issue. Um, for the three panelists, uh, you talked about University of Chicago. My friend and I are trying to get Queens to adopt the University of Chicago principles. What are your thoughts on the Chicago principles of freedom of expression? Another thing for the audience to look at. And secondly, we've been able to get a meeting for Principal Wolf. What uh, are your What are your thoughts on speaking to administrators with respect to this issue? So, who is this question for? Well, all the who's Principal Wolf? <laughs> principal Wolf is the principal of Queen's University. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I guess I'll just reiterate that I, I I strongly support the position that University of Chicago came up with. But again, as I mentioned earlier. It's easy to walk, uh, talk to talk, but then not walk to walk, right? So you can't from this side of your mouth have that manifesto, but then from that side of the mouth have people uh, answering Title IX uh, indoctrination camps. So to the extent that they're willing to truly adhere to those tenets, then of course I support it. Well, best of luck to you, like, go for it. It'll sharpen you up a lot to, to pursue that fight. You'll have to really learn the principles and learn how to defend them. And, you know, that'll serve you well as you move forward through life, the exercise. And you never know, you might get somewhere with it. So, good for you. Hi, who's your question for? Um, it's uh, for the three of you, uh, because I'm hoping you might have different insights on it. Uh, I'm a first year engineering student uh, over at Carlson, and I found that during my experiences, I've had to keep my head low and focus a lot on my studies. But um, I've recently tried to find out groups on the left, so I decided to join the most extreme uh, communist group. Uh, they call themselves the Student Revolution Movement or something like that. And I went there and I found that they didn't really have too much of a purpose. Like, I tried probing them with a few questions because if I announced that I was like right leaning or anywhere close to that, they could like track me down or anything. Uh, yeah, so I found that they would mostly do like counter uh, protesting and things like that. And they actually didn't really have much of an agenda other than that, like for an hour and a half we discussed things and they didn't really have any ideas. So uh, I also asked them about conservative groups and they were all shut down. So I'm, the question is, how would I start up maybe a free speech or a conservative on campus. Why don't you take this one, Dr. Peter? Okay, two things. Um, the first is, it's not surprising that, that young people join radical movements like that, right? I mean, Jean Piaget, the developmental psychologist, talked about a late developmental stage in ad adolescence, which people don't talk much about, that he called the messianic. He said that young people, when they're catalyzing their adult identity, are looking for a way to contribute meaningfully to the world. 
And that's really what should be inculcated in universities, like, is to teach students how to meaningfully contribute to the world. And we don't do that. In fact, we teach them that the world is a corrupt and terrible place and that they should do everything they can to undermine it. And the problem with that is that it undermines them. And then they look for something they can do that's worthwhile. And, you know, and, and it's easy to find that in, in radical movement. And, and we can't be cynical about that. I mean, the radical leftist ideas entrapped millions ideologically in the 20th century. They're very attractive. So, but, okay, so that's the first thing. It's understandable and it, and it speaks of a lack of proper moral guidance by the, by the institutions of higher education. The students crave that, truly. That's what they're there for. They are cynical about it sometimes. They say they're there to, to work on their career, and some of them are, but most of them are coming to university hoping they could actually get educated. Okay, in terms of starting a club, start one. Just like, they contact some of the other clubs, like at the UBC, they have a huge free speech club now. I think it's got like a thousand members. Contact some of the clubs that have already started up and ask them how they did it. And then, are you, what year are you in? First year. So you've got four years to figure it out, you know, and it'd be good, it'd be really good to do it because we can set up a similar offshoot at Carpool. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Can I have a question for? men and so that might be reflected to some degree in the demographics here um, that's not the only thing that, that I think is going on I think that one of the things I've noticed most recently is that when I talk to public audiences you know people are usually pretty attentive but there's variation in the degree of attention but when I start to talk about responsibility and discipline and careful, articulated speech, then the room goes silent. And I think that's particularly something that young men, and perhaps not even so young, are, are dying to hear. Um, and I think that's because we've been fed a diet of rights and freedoms for 60 years. It's like, it's like eating nothing but sugary cereal. It's kind of fun in the short term, but there's nothing in it that's solid. You know, we were talking about the responsibilities of men. That was the first question, you know. And one of the things that popped into my mind afterwards was, um, and this, this has to do with responsibility in general, I would say men have to take responsibility for the fact that sex is a very serious business. And you think, well, people don't want to hear that because they want free and easy promiscuity. But free and easy promiscuity didn't deliver all the promises that it was supposed to deliver. Not at all. And, and, and for obvious reasons, if you think it through to any degree whatsoever. And I think that it's time. Society's moved back and forth. It's time to pick up the other side of the rights equation, and that's the responsibility. Right? Your rights are my responsibility. And vice versa, that's the contract. You can't have one without the other. And you need to do something noble in your life. You have to, because otherwise you can't stand yourself. And no wonder, you know, no wonder, obviously. And we don't tell people, we don't tell young men that anymore. So get your act together, for, for Christ's sake. The world needs you. You can't just monkey about like that. It causes trouble. And it denies the world the privilege of your light, let's say. And that hurts everyone, you most of all, but everyone else as well. And I, I think that's fundamentally true. That's the fundamental truth of Western civilization. And it's a message that's saleable now. I've been trying to talk to the conservatives about this. It's like, you guys have something to sell to young people for the first time in 
memorable history. It's seldom responsibility. What the hell? That's weird. Pay attention. It's what you do as conservatives. That's what conservatives do. They peddle responsibility. Well, it's the right message for the time. And I get hundreds of letters from, me, from young men, and, and they come up to me in forums like this and say, look, I've already been trying to get my act together. It's like, good, man. Do it. Do it, because otherwise things will fall apart. And we don't want that. Things are terrible when they fall apart. So, I'm, I'm going to offer it. Yeah. I'm not going to offer you any prescriptions, but I'm going to take seriously your question as to why there are more men. And I only thought about the answer now as I also looked around the room. And also, I have noticed that my followers are skewed much more towards men, which is surprising because I am, after all, eye candy. <laughs> Use it for eye candy. <laughs> that, that said, I think it, she's having a hard time keeping her uh, I, I think it actually uh, is a manifestation of one of the most robust universal sex differences that you see, and that's risk taking. So that's a sexually selected trait. So to the extent, regrettably, we should be the mainstream, but we've now become the dangerous radical professors. We're the non-mainstream, we're against the orthodoxy. Associating with us now construes as an act of risk-taking. And so to the extent that men on average, and certainly young men, are more likely to be risk-takers, that would then be depicted in the demographics that you're seeing. Thank you. And Mr. Kashiko? This is a question for Dr. Peterson. Yeah. Uh, just in reference to what you were saying about uh, Crunch, I think, or what was it? Uh, from, from earlier, and what you said before about uh, some of Young's work, uh, the experience of coming to an understanding with the author, and you've described it as terrifying. Uh, in the event that one uh, finds it maybe stimulating, appealing, and sort of uh, deterministically interesting in kind of the sense that you've described it, uh, like that field of, the, that kind of disturbing field of study, if that's appealing to one, uh, should one distance themselves from this person? Okay, so I want to make sure I got, I got your question right. So, are you asking whether if someone's interested in the darker side of things that you should distance yourself from them? Is that, is that the question? If that's the, the kind of the middle of the target board that is their interest? Well, kind of what, what it, it, it depends. I, I think that people can be interested in dark things for very bad reasons. And I've done a lot of reading about very bad people and the serial killer types, for example, who, who have to extend their malevolence with each sequential act of killing. You can be interested in dark things for very bad reasons. But, you know, you're, people are also attracted by their curiosity to the dark things, and for men in particular. And, and I don't understand female psychology as well, but for men, it's necessary to investigate that dark and aggressive side because that's actually what matures you. I mean, you can see this in such simple examples as I like to, as most of you probably know, I like to uh, analyze animated movies because brilliant people produce them. And there's a great scene in The Lion King where Simba finally grows up. He's this useless permanent adolescent with his friend the walking stomach and, you know, and he won't grow up until he's shamed by uh, Nella, right? which is a very nice observation. Um, when he undergoes his initiation, goes down into the darkness and reflects upon himself, um, he, his face hardens. And the animators caught that. His father has a very well-defined face, and it's, it's forceful. It's not accepting, it's forceful. And when he undergoes that transformation, then his face sets and he becomes determined and strong. And that's the incorporation of the shadow that Jung talked about. But it is a terrifying process. I mean, Carl Jung is a very terrifying thinker. One of the things he said about the shadow, which is the place of suppressed aggression, let's say, and, and sexual impulse. It's more than that, and it can be more than that, but that's good enough for the time being. 
He said that the, the roots of the shadow reach all the way to hell. And what he meant by that, it's a metaphorical statement in some sense, is that to understand the dark side of yourself is no different than to understand Auschwitz, for example. And worse, it's no different, there's no difference between that and understanding the role you probably would have played in Auschwitz had you been there. And you think, well, why could understanding that possibly be of any utility? And the answer is, incorporating that makes you someone not to be trifled with. And it's necessary for men to be someone who's not to be trifled with. And women know this. That's why I think the fundamental female myth, it's complicated, but in relationship to men is probably beauty and the beast. And the beauty is attracted to the beast, but the beast has to be tameable. And that's the right pattern for a man. Harmless, there's no such thing as a harmless man. A weak man is a dangerous, malevolent man. He's ashamed of his weakness, and, and he's resentful about his lack of status and ability. And he will take that out whenever he has a chance, and pretend all the time that he's harmless. A dangerous man, that's someone who's integrated that capacity for aggression and, and sexual uh, desire. It's part of his personality, and it manifests it in his actions. And that's the tameable beast, and, and that's, that's the right aim. So if someone is pursuing the darkness, let's say, to go through it and come back to the light, then more power to them, because that's how you get to the light. It's through the darkness and then to the light. That's the right thing to do. <laughs> but, but, but to go through the darkness properly, and to not, be, to not be destroyed by it. You have to be aiming at the light. Just, just a quick thing, because you made a promise a while back uh, to watch Rick and Morty in the biblical. <laughs> with that said, with what you just said, I, I, I definitely feel like Rick would be the, the incorporated shadow. Morty would be the dangerous uh, weakling, I, I'd say. Okay. <coughs> okay. Who's your question for? Like when he was younger, uh, the progressive bias was in the university, uh, but it wasn't as divided or toxic as it is now. Uh, Dr. Marty has said that freedom of speech is second to um, critical thinking, but without it, it's meaningless and kind of dangerous. Um, I fear that like many have lost their decency and um, speak at the, the whims of their emotions. What changed? And what do you think is likely to historically happen in our culture? Okay, who wants to take that one? So what, what caused the sort of the quagmire we're at today? Correct. Yeah, so, and it, f forgive me for plugging my forthcoming book, but it's tentatively titled Death of the West by a Thousand Cuts. The thousand cuts are the confluence of forces that exactly speak to what you're asking, right? So. Each of the movements that certainly everybody here, or certainly Dr. Peterson and I have talked about, postmodernism, cultural relativism, social constructivism, none of them is sufficient to bring down the edifice of reason. But have each of them chip away for 30, 40 years, you then end up with a populace, certainly within the ecosystem of the university, who no longer have the capacity to know what's left, what's right, what's up, what's down, because each of those movements are genuine injuries to the truth. That's what they have in common. And so what led us to the current point is the fact that they have gone unchallenged, at least within the social sciences and the humanities, for far too long. And what we're each trying to do here is to set the fulcrum straight again. That was a good answer. So. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, who's your question for? So this uh, question is for all three of you. Uh, so in today's climate, where could one uh, find material to, uh, where could I find places to learn uh, the liberal arts, to learn how to think critically? Uh, so with all this culture Marxism, 
in Jordan Peterson's online university. Yeah. Well, I would say all, all the classic books of the Western world are available for free at Amazon. Right? You can download them onto your Kindle. Go online and look up the 100, 100 greatest books of Western civilization or the 20 greatest books. I have a reading list on my website. You can check that out. There are books that have been particularly influential to me. Um, go back and like read those people that the entire culture have elevated to the status of genius. That wasn't a conspiracy. It was a consensus decision. And it's often difficult, you know, but good. Good, it should be difficult. Life is difficult. But that's what I would say. Educate yourself. If you're in university, basically you have to educate yourself, especially in the humanities, right? It's always been that way to some degree. Although for a long time your professors weren't actually working to diseducate you as hard as they could at the same time. So that's what I would recommend is read, man. My question is for everyone on the stage. So Serena, in your introduction, you mentioned that you were of the Milton Mill School of Thought and that you believe that reprehensible ideas should be brought to light. Yep. I understand that Faith Goldie was removed from the original August panel because of her podcast with the controversial Daily Stormer after Charlottesville. This seems like a performative contradiction to remove Faith because of one interview while claiming to believe in freedom of speech. This strategy also appears to parallel the SJWs who wish to deny platforms for controversial conservative speakers. I want to understand why Faith Goldie was removed from the event simply for associating with identitarians and what do each of the panelists believe or agree with that decision? That's an excellent question. Right, so, so the first thing I should say is it's, it's not like there, we're unaware of the irony, right? So, number one, yeah. Ryerson canceled uh, a, a panel about the cancellation of panels about free speech, right? That's irony number one. And then irony number two was the panelists removed a speaker for arguably engaging in the act of free speech. Okay, we got that, believe me. All right, so why did we come to this decision? I sat down personally, and the other people can say what they have to say. I sat down with my son, and we went through Faith's interview. I, I know Faith. Um, I don't believe that she's a reprehensible person. Um, I think that Charlottesville was very shocking to her. I think that she put herself in a very difficult position. And I think some of that was brave, that she went down there to cover it. However, I listened very carefully to her podcast, the, the one that got her in trouble. And my sense was that she didn't, she was, she was associating with people whose views she should have questioned. It was her journalistic um, responsibility to question them. She had to ask at least one hard question. At least one. Three would have been better. You know, and I understand that she had to toe a careful line. She was on the podcast. They had invited her on. It's much more difficult than you might think when you're facing people, even if you don't believe them, to be rude enough to challenge them, right? That's not so easy, especially if you're an agreeable person, and she is a rather agreeable person. But I believe that she, she failed in her journalistic responsibility. And as a consequence of that, she became too hot a property for us, and not just for us. And, well, that was, that was the reason for the decision. So, that was, that was my reasoning, so. I'll just add that we all spoke at length about this, the entire panel. This was not an overnight decision at all. Uh, and that was a question that we really struggled with in terms of what you just said, the Milton Mill School of Thinking. But there was a deeper question about the role of a journalist, because Faith is a journalist. And so we did hear the interview, so there was no journalism really taking place. Uh, I've met Faith, I like her, I'm the one who invited her. Um, uh, I, I find her to be a very nice person. But um, like Dr. Peterson just said, there was those other factors at play here. Um, 
Had she asked those questions and still had done that show, I, of course we'd have her here. Absolutely. But those questions were not even asked. And that was an issue. I don't know if Dr. Saad... Um, I was just going to yeah. say exactly the same thing, that we were all very aware of this issue. And if you could see the number of email exchanges we went back. So it's not as though we didn't struggle with the matter and didn't recognize you know, the seriousness of the issue. But there is also a pragmatism, right? Uh, you may decide that you, you're all for freedom of speech. That doesn't mean that you invite to a dinner party someone whose views you don't agree with. I, I'm not saying that that was the case with Faith Boldy. So, so the fact that you might, for some event, decide to disassociate from that person doesn't suggest that you are being hypocritical to freedom of speech, that there is a pragmatism that's set in. If she were here, perhaps there would have been a greater desire from some of the agitators to shut us down. Would that have served a good purpose for all of you to not be here? So, so at the end, what we ended up doing is went for pragmatism, not, notwithstanding the fact that we appreciate your point. I was very pragmatic. I kept saying that we were looking at the pragmatics. Plus, I want to add, as soon as we hung up on the call, I made the decision. I called Faith right away, and I told her, I said, I'm sorry. I said, I explained my position, and I reached out to her and said, if you want to speak, give me a call. Because I felt bad for what yeah, we did. I talked to her, too. And I, talk, I talked to her as well. We all and, felt and I'm the only one who hasn't saw apologies <laughs> for, for being an utter asshole. Yeah, I mean, we felt to some degree that we threw her under the bus. You know, and, and at a time in her life where she was really in crisis, you know, um, and, and, but the journalism issue was really crucial here because she wasn't just doing that as a, as a, like, everyday individual. She was, she was technically in the role of journalist, and the role of journalist is to ask hard questions, especially under uncertain circumstances. So, that was our decision. Great question, thank you. Hello. Okay, hi. Yeah, your question. Uh, not a question, but I won't take up much time. I just have a very short story to share. Um, my name is Oliver Marshall. I'm a student at Concordia University in Montreal. About three months ago, I had set out to meet with Mary Zhang, who is president of Student Support and Free Speech Toronto. And we just wanted to host a night to see if there'd be such an interest in Montreal to open a chapter. On my way to the bar, I was confronted by 15 Antifa members who encircled me, ripped my bag out of my hands, and threatened violence against me. I barely escaped, but there was four skinhead types. This was very scary. This, they looked exactly like the Nazi skinheads. We, we, we can all pers and I'll see. Um, and I, I, I shared an account of the story after, and, and Jordan Peterson commented and shared it as well. I was very uh, recognizing of that. And he said, um, you know, don't be afraid. If you, if you give in, they win. I like to say that today I think we win, because even though it's a small victory, I think we've gotten a lot of people together today, and I've seen a lot of happy faces, all to support the wonderful master value of free speech. To which I have another small couple of words to say in the form of a poem. My words. Sometimes the words I use are just the right ones to light the fuse. Sometimes the words I use are tantamount to modern day abuse. Sometimes the words I use echo chambered from the news. Sometimes the words I use sigh into oblivion as they are too obtuse. But most times the words I employ are not a part of some vapid ploy, but rather to gather my thoughts, my expressions, my ideas, my fears. To rationalize in the face of demise. Sometimes the words I use will be the ones that make me lose. But always the words I use will be the words I choose.
欢迎收听。More questions. I'm, I'm really sorry, but I know Dr. Saad has a flight to take, but Dr. Peterson, you're going to stick around a bit, and Dr. Emete, to maybe if people wanted to approach you in the halls or afterwards, because it's almost 5 30. Okay, so what we're supposed to do is go and get some pictures taken. That yeah. shouldn't take more than about 10 minutes, and then I'll come out and talk to people for, say, 20 minutes, something like okay. that. After that, I'm going to collapse, so that'll be enough. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay. Yeah, so the okay. lady and... Well, Hi. Hi. Um, this is uh, regarding the gender dysphoria, whatever can answer this. Um, what are the criteria for identifying or de-identifying mental illness within the DSM? And how are these criteria developed? And were they adhered to when gender dysphoria was redefined as a non-issue? Or as something that we had to cater to, pander to, that kind of thing? Law? Yeah, uh, well, gender dysphoria still is in the diagnostic and statistical manual. Mental disorders that cause significant distress, you're very dissatisfied with your body and it can impact, have a negative impact on your functioning and significant distress. However, many professionals are refusing to adhere to these principles. And so that when it comes to gender dysphoria, transgender issues, and so on, when I say this, people are going to call me a transphobe. My trans patients know I'm not. Um, there's a, way too much ideology, and that's why I was talking earlier about um, the impact on people. Uh, young, vulnerable children who don't know what they are, who they are, are being pushed in directions that they're going to regret potentially. 80 to 90 percent of them will regret later on. So this is one of the areas. And when we're talking about the, uh, the small numbers, if you think of the number of people who are truly trans, 8.03 percent around that issue, they've wielded a lot of power uh, over all spheres of life, it seems. So, and again, I'm, I'm very... But it's worse than that, because it's a tiny fraction of that tiny fraction who've wielded the power. Because the activist proportion of the trans community isn't much greater than the activist proportion of you know, the, the common community. Right. So it's a tiny, tiny percentage, and, and they, they set their sights on targets. Uh, you know, so many people who were their allies, they say the wrong thing, they get shut down, they get attacked, they get physically uh, injured because of this. So it's pure ideology, um, and, but in theory, we should adhere to certain principles as to what's the best practice. It's not being followed. And where, where, where can I find the rules as to how, like, what, where can I find this criteria so I can just sort of... Look up the DSM-5, yes. Diagnostic and Statistics Manual 5, and it's a, it's a hybrid of scientific reasoning and consensus building, because psychiatry is half science, let's say, and half applied art. And so the diagnostic categories are like that as well. So. Thanks. Thank you. Last question. Hi. Um, Serena, you mentioned yeah. teachers being afraid. And uh, Dr. Peterson, yeah. you mentioned Boise at length, uh, which I know um, from my personal experience and from peers to be a particularly petrifying place on the U of D. And uh, I'm also concerned with the Elementary Teacher Federation of Ontario's policy on social justice education and how this will affect the next generation of youth. Um, I'm wondering what we can do to make sure our children are properly educated. Who's the question for? Uh, Peterson or anyone else? Dr. Peterson? Well, I think writing would be people responsible for the Ontario Institute of the Studies of Education might not be a bad start. Also the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, also the Minister of Education. But, and letters make more difference than you think, you know. Um, and that's particularly true for governmental agents, agencies. They take them more seriously than you might believe. Um, you have to educate yourself about what's going on. You have to read the platform of the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, for example, because like, when things are functioning, you can ignore them. And that, that's really the definition of a decent state, is you can ignore it, most of it. It's working. And that's been the definition of the Canadian state for a very long time. And it's a very peculiar thing that we have to actually wake up and pay attention to our politics. But we do now. I believe we do anyways. And so, 
well, that's what everyone's doing here, is trying to be a little bit more alert to what's happening. And you have to let your kids know, too, what, what they're being taught. And see if you can help them figure out how to analyze it, assess it, and reject it if necessary. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I see the lineups are huge, and I feel bad. I'm sorry, but that's the, all the time we have. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your schedule and on Remembrance Day to be a part of this very important panel discussion, which we think really impacts each and every one of us. Uh, I want I'd like to thank the Canada Christian College. I went through a lot of venues, but people were too terrified to have us here, and they stood up to, you know, criticism. And so I, I want to thank Dr. Charles McVitie and staff. Better. Kale Schmidt and Jonathan for that great video you put together. Thank you very much. And I want to thank Dr. Peterson, Dr. Amate, Dr. Stad for, you know, you have such busy schedules and your requested speakers both nationally and internationally and the fact that you were so supportive and you did this for me, I'm very, very grateful and I really want to thank you. Thank you so much. Montreal, so I, I guess you're leaving. Well, I, I'm going to do okay. photography shoots, uh, and then I can maybe, if we finish, come back out and shake hands. And say You've got to share his eye candy with the world. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Amate and Dr. Peterson and myself will be sticking around for a bit. Yeah, we'll go have her yeah. photo fix and we'll come out. We both okay? wanted to chat. Thank you.